The title of this whole day has the word resilience and mission and organization in it. So I will start by um, sort of discussing what do we mean by an organization's mission and why is it important to, to think about it. Um, Summer mentioned uh, disruptive events that affects organizations, uh, which puts stress on them. So I'll spend a few minutes to uh, remind you of uh, some of the recent uh, events and talk about them, how they have affected some organizations. Now, these events have been happening since, uh, uh, since uh, we've kept history. So the question is, how has it changed? How has the risk environment changed? And I'll talk about that for a few minutes. At which point, I will start uh, introducing the concepts of operational resilience, giving you some definitions. What does it mean by operational resilience? And then at that point, we go and revisit the first topic. We'll revisit the organizational mission now that we know what operational resilience uh, has been defined. And then I will quickly refer to uh, some success stories that you're going to hear about much more later this afternoon. So let's talk about organizational mission. So let me give you some, some examples to illustrate what, what uh, my colleagues and I mean when we talk about organizational mission. Uh, so Red Cross, a very important um, entity across the world that if you go to their website, uh, have a very brief statement of what their mission is. And they achieved their mission by doing things like helping during uh, disasters. They try to uh, provide us safe and adequate uh, blood supply during uh, both times of stress and during times of norm normalcy. And they uh, educate uh, us from perspective of health and safety. These are missions of American Red Cross. It's very important for, for, for American Red Cross to have uh, processes in place so adequate and safe supply of blood is available all the time. It's important for them to the, for that mission to be, to be operational all the time. Let's look at another organization, uh, United States Postal Service, or any other postal organization in other countries. Uh, they deliver mail to our houses. Uh, they sell stamps. However, at the same time, some, one of their mission is to make sure that mail that gets delivered to us is safe. That's an important mission for any postal organization. And they go out of their way to make sure that happens. Delivery of safe mail is a critical mission for United States Postal Service. And making sure that mission is always executed is important. In this country, uh, Defense Information Services Agency is the government agency who delivers information technology services to our armed forces and uh, to our warriors on the field. They achieved that mission by uh, implementing and delivering a variety of IT services, a variety of networks, telecommunications, uh, and variety of services on the field. Those activities are important for DISA to achieve its mission. They go out of their way to do things to make sure those mission is continuously, continuously operational. When we talk about operational resilience or organization's mission, the entity doesn't have to be a large organization. It could be a family. It could be a city. It could be a evergreen tree, as you see on this slide. That tree has a mission. It provides shades. It provides habitats for birds. It enables our kids to uh, climb, etc. It has a mission. That entity does something to make its mission operational on a daily basis. Now, 
when you look at this picture, you see that tree that looked very green is under stress. It's under operational stress. However, it still is being able to deliver its mission. Still looks pretty green, pretty solid looking, etc. That could be an analogy of saying that entity is being operationally resilient, is continued to deliver its services under stress. Stress. Our organizations, our cities, ourselves are continuously under operational stress. A couple of years ago, when the chief executive officer of Micron Technology passed away accidentally over the weekend, that put operational stress on that very important corporation. One of the last few comp companies in this country who designed and manufactures electronic circuitry in this country. Operational stress on a company due to passing away of one of the executives. A couple of years ago, there was a tornado in the middle of the United States affecting a relatively small manufacturing uh, facility. That small tornado affecting that small manufacturing facility put operational stress on major manufacturing locations of Boeing company on both the West Coast and the East Coast, thousands of miles away. Because of the interdependencies of supply chain. There was a small fire in a very small chemical manufacturing company in Germany a couple of years ago that generated havoc in Detroit. And you may ask why. Well, that small chemical manufacturing company in Germany manufactures 50% supply of a particular chemical that is used in manufacturing brake pads in all of our automobiles. That's why that small fire in that small manufacturing uh, facility in Germany caused operational stress in all automobile manufacturers in Detroit. Uh, there was a major uh, collapse of electric grid in India uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, causing hundreds of millions of people be being without power for, for days. That put operational stress on, on those people, on those communities, and on those entities who operate in those regions. Operational stress comes from both man-made and natural disasters. It comes from both kinetic and cyber and IT uh, sources. Uh, glitches that our technology experience uh, causes operational stress on our daily lives, such as uh, this particular incident that affected uh, American Airlines, which in turn affected many travelers. Natural incidents. Hurricane Sandy drastically affected the east coast of the United States. Some of the more recent natural disasters in Philippines put tremendous operational stress on both people and the business in that country. And the city of Boston was under operational stress in April of last year due to bombing. And yes, cyber attacks of all nature, whether they 
affect our news media, whether they affect our major banks and financial institutions, and whether they affect our stock market. This is a good example of how a very minor breach on a single Twitter account caused havoc on stock market last April. And more and more and more. So as you uh, see, our organizations are, are continuously under operational stress. And that is a challenge. One may ask, well, maybe this is because we are experiencing more incidents. Maybe there are more storms. Maybe there are more attacks in the cyber domain. Maybe people are being less careful. In fact, if we look at the statistics, long-term statistics, uh, there is no uh, true evidence that says the percentage or the number of incidents has increased over the years. So we have to ask the question, what other issues should we look at to, to explain this, this additional stress that we experience or we read about? Disruptive events, of course, is how these stresses are created. Throughout the rest of the day, we talk about how disruptive events can be dealt with in some new ways. Disruptive events that are both uh, natural or man-made, accidental or intentional, uh, cyber or kinetic. If we try to uh, learn how to deal with disruptive events and uh, from a risk management perspective, you will see there are techniques that will help us to better uh, deal with operational resilience in our organization. Now, I said there is no hard evidence that there are more incidents taking place, but something has changed. What has changed between 10, 15 years ago versus how we operate our lives today? Clearly, the level of sophistication and, and capability of a technology has increased. But we pay a price for that. The price we pay for that is the complexity of our technology. For example, as this slide demonstrates, clearly our airplanes and our aircrafts are much more sophisticated today However, they also carry tremendous amount of complexity. You can measure that different ways. For example, the number of software uh, modules or lines of code that you need to operate today's technology. 10, 15 years ago, if a company wanted to get into e-business, the typical solution was you would go and buy one big server you would find a data center to house it. You would put all of the software that we required in it, application software, operating system, database, everything. You would connect it to a local area network. You would buy a single T1 connection to the internet, and you were up and running. And then, uh, if you heard there were some uh, virus on the internet that might affect you, you will go and buy a firewall and put it in front of it. And if you thought that maybe there were, could have been a fire in the building, you would start using a tape backup. And you would take the tape backup, hopefully, in some remote site, just in case it was needed. If you did all of this, you know, you would have done what was necessary at that time to make sure your mission continues to be operational. Today, our applications are much more complex. Even the most simplest application we use today depends on resources, hardware and software, 
that are spread across the world. And the business processes that those applications execute are much more complex. Clearly, we have much more capability, but we have to deal with this complexity. The price we pay is much more difficult to keep them operational. 10, 15 years ago, a well-managed large corporation probably would have had a disaster recovery plan on a team, a business continuity team, uh, and maybe an emergency response group, and uh, in the government area, uh, maybe a, a continuity of operations activity. If all of those were in place, uh, they had a good chance to protect their mission if there was an incident. Over the years, however, as we have come across new operational risks to deal with, this is a typical set of preparedness plans or sustainment activities that organizations have to put in place to protect and sustain their operations. Every time a new risk has occurred over the last several years, a new activity is kicked off in our large organizations to deal with it. This model is not sustainable. It's so many stovepipes, it becomes inefficient. And the question is, are there better ways to deal with it? So for the rest of the today, we're going to talk about how the concept of operational resilience can help organizations to become more sure that their operations are continuously available. So some definitions. So operational risk. So risk management is not something new. Risk management has been around for a long time. Organization has been dealing with risk for, for a long time. In today's discussion, we're going to be talking about a subset of all the risk that organization deals with. The type of risk that affects organizations' day-to-day -day operations. We refer to it as operational risk. It turns out that, in fact, is the biggest bucket of all the risks that typical organizations deal with. As Summer referred to and mentioned earlier this morning, these are the type of risks that are made worse by actions of us, the people, systems and technology that we use, because they fail. Failure of our organization's internal processes, independent of how they're executed, whether they're executed by people or technology, if those processes are not good, they will cause or increase operational risk, and of course, um, external events both man-made and intentional. Now, why is it that we pay more attention for the rest of today on operational risk? Because they're important. They matter to the customers. They matter to the employees. They matter to what type of image and reputation an organization has. They matter because they affect life and safety of both customers and employees. It affects how efficient or productive an organization is. They're important because operational risks have direct impact on organization's mission. And therefore, we want to be able to manage operational risk. One way to manage your operational risk to become more resilient. So if you pick up your favorite dictionary and look up the definition of resilience, you will find a variety of definitions from different fields. You will find definitions dealing with health. You will find definitions dealing with science and physics. You will find definitions related to systems. I think for the purpose of today and the discussion of operational resilience, the two definitions that are highlighted 
in red are probably the most relevant. Ability to provide and maintain an acceptable level of service in the face of faults and challenges. Physical property of a material that can return to its original shape or position after being under stress. We are looking for organizations, we are looking for systems, we are looking for entities who can demonstrate these resilience properties. And the question is, how can a system, an organization, or an entity, or a tree for that matter, become operationally resilient? We define operational resilience as an emergent property of an entity. An emergent property of an entity that can continue its mission. If it's US postal system, to continue delivering safe mail. If it's Red Cross, for it to be able to continue supply us with safe and adequate blood supply. An entity that continue to carry out its mission in the presence of operational stress. What do I mean by entity? Well, again, we are very generic discussion here from a perspective of the concept of operational resilience applies to a wide range of things whether it's a small or a large organization, whether it's a nation, whether it's an armed forces of a nation, whether it's a critical infrastructure, whether it's a department, whether it's a family, whether it's an ecosystem. So the concept applies to that entity that you are interested in its operational mission. The concept of emergent property could be a... Uh, uh, sometimes difficult to, to, to appreciate. So let me give you an analogy. I think we all agree that as people, we all like to be healthy. Now, I have yet to find a store that I can go to and buy health. So how do I become healthy? In order for me to become healthy, I have to eat well. I have to sleep enough. I have to exercise adequately. I have to stop doing some stupid things. If I do all of those good things, not only today, not only tomorrow, not only next week, but for an extended period of time. Health emerges in my body. Health is an emergent property for human beings. Health and resilience are both emergent properties. For an organization, for an entity to become more resilient, for that organization to develop that emergent property, they have to start doing some good things on a regular basis and make sure those good things become part of the nature of that organization. The discussion for the rest of today is what are good, those good things to do, how organizations can uh, learn how those good things are, how do you make them stick to the organization. So now that we have talked about operational resilience, what it means and what its uh, importance are, let's go and revisit the concept of organization's mission. I remind you, think about not about systems or servers or networks or boxes. We are trying to make sure organization as a whole is operational resilience. And therefore, the discussion is about 
an organization's overall mission. An organization achieves its, organization, or achieves its mission by developing or providing some services and products. Red Cross achieves its mission by developing and, and providing some services. One of those services is adequate and safe blood supply. For United States Postal Service, they have a wide range of products and services that they deliver in order to achieve their mission, anywhere from delivery of the mail for individuals to supporting business transactions from a perspective of mail processing. Those services and products that are important to success of that organization are developed or provided when that organization executes certain productive activities, certain business processes within its organization. For the Red Cross to be able to deliver adequate and safe blood supply they clearly have a set of trained individuals to draw blood. That is a productive activity. Red Cross has a set of laboratories that is used to make sure the blood is safe. That is a productive activity or a business process that enables Red Cross to deliver that specific service or product. For my example of the United States Postal Service, if you look at one of their key products and services, delivery of mail, in order for that to take place, Postal Service has multiple internal business services and business processes, whether it's payroll system for the employees, whether it's uh, IT infrastructure, whether uses of uh, trucks and airplanes to deliver the mail, all of those business <clears throat> processes are necessary for United States Postal Service to achieve its mission. So we should ask, <clears throat> what is critical for those business processes to continue operating, not only under normal conditions, but also under stress? All organizations depend on certain assets to execute those productive activities. Those assets could be people, both employees, and also people outside of the organization that are necessary to execute those useful activities. <clears throat> information assets, whether it's digital, whether it's a piece of information that's written on a piece of paper, or the information that we keep in our head. Technology assets. And when we talk about technology assets, we don't just mean IT technology assets. We mean a lot more than just computers and networks. If you are operating a water treatment plant, all the equipment that you have in the field to control the flow of water and monitor it is technology that is necessary for useful activities to be operational. Facility assets. Of course, these useful activities take place in some facilities, facilities that organizations own or rent or use. And also assets that you get from other places, supply chain, raw material. So, continuing to build that organizational mission picture, we see that for those productive activities to be operational, to enable the organization's mission, we need to look at <clears throat> key assets. Because when there is a disruption, 
when there is an incident. Assets are the things that become unavailable. If a critical asset is affected, it will affect certain productive activities or business processes, which in turn makes the service or product unavailable, which in turn results in a failure of that organization's mission. So you can think about the fact that operational resilience starts at the asset level. And that's why it's important to look at organization's mission from this picture's perspective. And then ask the question, OK, what should I be doing? What are the good things should I be doing in our organization to make sure my assets are protected and sustained? Clearly, you have to do some stuff so the asset is not affected. You have to protect it from incidents. All of our organizations do those type of things. We uh, put in place information security solutions. We uh, design fault-tolerant systems. We also do things to sustain the operations after <clears throat> an incident. We put in place disaster recovery plans to recover affected IT systems. We put in place pandemic plans to deal with uh, situations that people have been affected by certain viruses, etc. What operational resilience techniques will teach us is this protection and sustainment activity should be done in an integrated fashion. They should not be done in stovepipes, and there should be a balance as to how much protection, how much sustainment you want to put in place. Again, let me give you an analogy, because we all have experienced this concept of protection and sustainment in our daily activities. When you drive on, on highways, we often see very heavy-duty guardrails on the side of the highway. They are there to protect us. So if there's an accident, the car is not uh, leave the road <clears throat> or falls in a ditch. But we know there are certain accidents that affect those guardrails, and those guardrails become ineffective. For example, if there's an accident involving a very large truck, that truck may go through that guardrail, and therefore we will not be available to protect the rest of us who want to use the road. So what happens when a police arrives at a site of such accident? One of the first things they do, particularly at nighttime, they put a set of flares where the guardrail was because they want to make sure the road remains available. They are trying to sustain the operations of the road. The guardrail is a protection mechanism. The flares are a sustainment activity. We need them both for the mission of that road to be available all the time. Again, we'll come back to this subject over and over again, operational resilience begins at the asset level. IT disaster recovery, business continuity planning, cybersecurity activities, supply chain, conti supply chain continuity uh, activities, emergency management. All of these are risk, operational risk management activities that our organizations do. The concept of operational resilience is, how do you do these activities so they are integrated, they're not in stovepipes, and you do it in such a way that becomes part of an organization's DNA? Those activities, those risk management activities, those operational risk management activities, we refer to as resilience processes. The model, resilience management model, that Summer mentioned at the beginning of today's discussion operates 
in that box that is referred to as operational resilience management system. Our MEM model tells us, teaches us, what are the good things to do in that box and how to do them so they become part of organization's DNA in order to make that organization more resilient. Clearly, now you're starting to ask the question, all right, sounds like a good story. Where do I go to learn more? Where do I go to find out what are all the good things I should be doing? So the work that CERT has been doing for the last seven, eight years on the subject, as Summer mentioned earlier today, has been documented in our body of knowledge that's referred to as CERT resilience management model. Uh, there will be presentations about details of this model, and there will be presentations about how this model has been used successfully. As you uh, read the news, as you monitor the discussion in your community, as you, this, as you see news from our federal government, around the world or other countries. One thing that we've noticed as is that over the last couple of years, the concept of resiliency has become very desirable. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's asking how to do it because we are coming to the conclusion that the traditional ways to sustain and protect our business mission is not sufficient anymore. And therefore, the concept of resilience is becoming um, very uh, desirable, and therefore today's day-long series of presentations. So uh, some success stories that I'm just going to refer to very briefly, because for each one of them, there will be a presentation later on today. There have been small and large organizations who have been in forefront of utilizing and putting in practice the concepts of operational resilience. Anywhere from United States Postal Inspection Service, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, and large corporations uh, such as Lockheed Martin. You will hear either through specific case studies about these success stories, or and or you will hear about our collaborators from these entities who will join us this afternoon on a panel discussion. So, so my job to, was to sort of set the stage, define some terms, uh, justify the discussion of operational resilience. So let me close by raising some questions. Let me do that by using example of Hurricane Sandy. It affected the east coast of the United States, particularly New York and New Jersey drastically. Those of us who live in the state of New York knew that this storm was coming about 10 days ahead of time. So it was not a surprise that it was coming. It was not a surprise that it was a huge storm. It was not a surprise that we would most probably experience power loss and flooding and wind damage because of the past experience with large hurricanes. With all of that experience and with all of that week long notice, Hurricane Sandy still surprised us in many ways. Nobody was expecting a devastating fire in a Point Breeze neighborhood of New York that destroyed hundreds of houses. 
in the middle of a hurricane. Nobody was expecting a blizzard in West Virginia as the hurricane was moving across the east coast of the United States. Nobody was expecting to observe sandstorm effect in New Jersey in the middle of a hurricane. There was no shortage of portable electric generators. We had learned our lessons from 9-11. There was plenty supply of portable electric generators. But you know, there was a shortage of power strips. That was a surprise. Disruptive events will continue to, dis to, to surprise us. What questions should we be asking? Now, after Hurricane Sandy was over, the most prevalent question that was raised in the media had to do with, ah, this was because of climate change. Now, that is an important question. But that's not the type of question should we be asking if we are interested in making our organization's mission operationally resilient. The question should we be asking is, why is it that this hurricane was worse than other hurricanes? What has changed in our risk environment? When 9-11 happened, I was on a business trip in Atlanta, Georgia. I only carried two devices that required frequent charging, a rudimentary cell phone and a laptop. Today when I travel, my briefcase has 11 gadgets that require frequent charging. Therefore, any power loss will cause me a lot more headache than it did after 9-11. We are giving up using landlines in favor of using cell phones. The same failure of communication networks will cause more havoc because of that. And as we move our houses and our communities and our entertainment closer to the water, the same hurricane will cause a lot more discomfort. We have made our risk environment worse. That is the question that we need to ask. How has the risk environment gotten worse? Why is it getting worse? And what should we do about it? It's somewhat irrelevant how often the incidents take place or how big the incidents are. Because the successful management of today's risk environment may need different techniques. So, let me summarize. Protection and sustainment of our organization's mission, it's a very, very challenging, multifaceted challenge. Regardless of the experience we have, regardless of lessons learned from other disruptive events, disruptive events will surprise us, man-made or natural, cyber or not, kinetic or IT-based. And we have observed that traditional tools and techniques are not as effective. We should ask the questions, are there better techniques that we should consider to better sustain and protect our organizations so their operational mission is successful. And that's the topic of the rest of the presentations today. Some techniques, some research, some lessons learned, and some case studies from other organizations who have successfully done things a little differently. Again, us at CERT, at SCI, we ask 
different type of questions when it comes to operational resilience. We ask questions about, are there better frameworks and models for us and organizations use to characterize their operational resilience? Are there better ways to teach both designers, engineers, and operators with regards to design and operation of, of systems? Are there things that we should worry about with regards to policy that affects operational resilience? Et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the questions that my colleagues and I here at CERT and SCI continually ask to help improve our body of knowledge dealing with operational resilience. So Shane, I think I'm going to stop. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today. We have an exciting set of presentation coming this morning, this afternoon, and a very, very exciting panel discussion. And uh, see if there are any questions. So we'll get on to our questions for Nodder. Uh, first one from Amy asking, do you consider connections and relationships between organizations, for example, with third-party suppliers or business partners, to be an organizational asset which should be protected as with information, people, facilities, et cetera? Amy, thanks for that question. That is an excellent question. Uh, so when I was uh, discussing, uh, when we revisited the organization mission, and I started drawing those uh, uh, pictures that demonstrate how assets are important from a perspective of making business processes available, I, uh, I had listed five different types of assets. One of them I had labeled as supply chain slash raw material. Your question falls in that category. Clearly, supply chain raw material, the relationship between organizations who's using it and the entities who deliver their external resources to the organization is critical. And therefore, if you do not understand, monitor, keep track, and protect those relationships, that particular class of assets could negatively be affected. Some of the examples I gave, for example, when that fire took place in the chemical factory in Germany, the relationship between that supplier and the rest of the world's automotive industry maybe was not well understood. Otherwise, Detroit would have not had reacted as, uh, in, as, we're not as surprised as they would have been. So yes, your question is very valid and those relationships are very important. Okay, next from uh, Jennifer asking, how can an organization measure their resilience? And I'm sure that's something we'll cover throughout the day, but if you don't mind addressing here as well. Okay, Jennifer is asking a really hard question. So you will see for the rest of today, my colleagues and I will give you some ideas. What are the, all the good things to do to become more resilient, and how to make sure those good things become part of the organization's day-to-day -day life. But how do you measure whether good things are happening, whether you're more resilient? That's a tough question. Later today, you'll hear about the uh, concept of maturity models, or maturity model frameworks. That is one mechanism. Use of those frameworks, those of you with maturity models, is one way that organizations can characterize how resilient they are today. Use that mechanism to set a goal for improvement. And use the same maturity model, those frameworks, again, to continuously, quote unquote, measure themselves to see whether they're achieving their goals. So there are some techniques that we talk about. Uh, some of the measurement techniques for measuring resilience, which is an emergent property, is very difficult. So there are some good techniques. 
but more research and development is necessary to come up with better mechanism to measure so you can measure your return on investment in this area. Okay. Before we get to the last question that's in the, in the queue for now, um, we are getting a number of questions on if the materials are available and a, a recording. Uh, the materials, uh, meaning the slides from the presentation, along with other cert work on resilience management, is in that materials widget. Uh, we may have a, an issue with one of the downloads that we will get fixed, uh, but the rest of the materials should be in there that you can walk away with now. Um, and this is being archived, so it will be available um, and we'll give you a notice through email when the archive is up and ready. Uh, but for the last question for Nodder, for now, unless someone wants to chime in, is from Tom asking, how is resilient man resilience management different from traditional preparedness planning activities, such as disaster recovery, business continuity, information security, et cetera? Tom, this is a question that we get very often. So. When organization put in place a disaster recovery plan and put in place the uh, corresponding uh, IT infrastructure to be prepared in case there was an event, uh, what they're doing, they are doing operational risk management. When an organization stands up a business continuity organization and they create business continuity plans and they do business impact analysis associated with that, what they're doing they are doing operational risk management. When we invest in cybersecurity, information security teams to protect our IT infrastructure, what we are doing, we are doing operational risk management. When we have a plan in place for uh, dealing with pandemic events or dealing with other emergencies that affects human, what are we doing? We are doing operational risk management. So our organizations have been doing operational risk management for a long time, except we are doing it in stovepipes. And therefore, they're not as efficient. The concept of operational resilience is to ask the questions. Are we doing the right amount of protection and sustainment? Are we doing them in an integrated fashion? Are we making sure these things become part of organization's DNA? So that's the real difference. Okay, another question came in, came in from Prince, uh, question slash comment saying, this may be answered later in the presentation, but many of the concepts in resilience appear reminiscent of the systemic risk concept from the financial services areas. Any comment or agreement there, Otter? So, as, uh, as I was earlier during my presentation, as I was uh, giving you uh, examples of... Uh, headline in the news, uh, one of the examples that I had was um, the major de denial of service attacks that was um, affecting some of our major banks in this country uh, last year. Clearly, our financial institutions have been doing risk management for a long time. In fact, that community who helped us seven, eight years ago to codify some of the resilience management model activities, clearly they do risk management and they actually uh, both do a good job. Yes, some of the concepts that we now talk about in a sense of operational resilience are things that financial industry has been doing for a long time. We are trying to make sure everybody else has learned that experience and expanded it to cover not just those risks that a financial institution has to deal with, but all operational risk. And yes, um, there will be at least uh, two other presentations today that may touch on the subject. Okay, Nader, thank you for a great presentation laying the foundation for, uh, for us to build on today.